Welcome back to the channel guys, this is Stories from the Jailhouse, we talk about everything jail related here. A big thank you to everyone that watches my channel, I just want to say a big thank you to you. And especially you guys that take the time to comment, you know, I couldn't thank you enough, I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to say if you've not been here before, I'm someone that spent 11 years of my life in and out of some of the toughest jails in England. I started as a 15 year old boy, come out at 27, and I just thought I've had enough of this. And I didn't really know what to do, I was a bit lost. And then I got into strongman, you know, doing um, pulling lorries, lifting big stones. And I become really good at it. And I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. And then I had an opportunity to open a tattoo shop. And then I had a family, most importantly, you know, and then I just slowly turned my life around. But it wasn't easy. It was hard. And I had a lot of people to talk about me badly, you know, say that I was broken. I was this, I was that. Because when I was involved with crime, it was always me that was... I was always the one in first, and I didn't give a shit. Anyone that was watching this that knows me knows that, you know, everything I'm saying here is the truth, mate. I was always the one that was game as fuck. I was the one that got good connections. I was the one that done most of everything, you know. Don't look, and a lot of people didn't want to see me, um, didn't want to see me go into something else, be successful at something else. Anyway, so. I'm going to talk to you about something. I really want you to hit, hit, listen to this, guys, right? Because it's serious. And when I was out, I was doing strong man. I was doing well. I got an injury. I went to hospital. While I was in hospital, I met a cardiologist. He was a really nice guy. He's a good friend of me. I'd say he's a friend, yeah? And he was, like, watching my videos. He was like, oh, my God, that's really extreme. Well done. And he knew my background, that I'd been in prison, because, obviously, he had my prison medical file. And he was like, well done for turning your life around and that. And then he said, look, have you ever had your heart checked? I said, no. He said, do you know your, your family history on your dad's side? I said, I haven't got a clue. I don't know my dad. He said, go and have your heart checked. So they took me for an X-ray first. And when I went for an X-ray, um, I could tell... Uh, something was wrong because of the way they were acting and I asked them what's the matter they said they couldn't tell me and I thought oh my god this sounds like a fucking police fucking interview and they was like look we need to go to have another um, another scan so he took me to have another scan cut a long story short guys I had fucking heart failure right and I was just like when the cardiologist told me that my heart was failing I said what do you mean my heart is failing I was 32 at the time, I felt great. And he was like, your other organs are taken over from your body. And I tell you what guys, I left there and I didn't believe him. I thought, fucking doctors, he's just trying to scare me to look after my body more. He doesn't want me putting fucking hormones in my body and fucking performance science and drugs. He's just giving me a fright, yeah? There's no way my heart's failing. It can't be failing. Look at me, I'm fucking great. I was the strongest I'd ever been. You know, I was like 25 stone. I was fucking absolutely a fucking monster. You know, I could bench press 240 kilo. I could fucking overhead press 180 kilo. I was a fucking monster of a fucking man. I got really strong. How the hell are you going to tell me to stop doing strong, man? I thought, no way, bollocks to you. That was my attitude, guys. I put my head in the sand and thought, no way, I'm not stopping it. I'm doing too good. And I got a letter through through the post and it was to go to Birmingham Hospital. I thought Birmingham Hospital, then I read it and it said transplant centre. I thought, oh, are you fucking kidding me now? Right, you want me to go to a transplant centre? This is a bit fucking much. So anyway, I drive to Birmingham, meet a doctor, I had loads of tests done, you know, I had to go on a running machine, I had to have all these sensors on me. It was like really thorough. And then I meet the doctor at the end, we're sat in the room and I goes to him and he was one of the best doctors in the world. And while I was in that transplant centre, I seen lots of young kids running around. And they were dying. And you know what? They never felt sorry for themselves because they hadn't grown up to low pity. Right? So when I watched these kids, I was just sitting there mes mesmerised by them. Playing, fighting, crying, but no sorrow, no feeling sorry for themselves. And you know, they weren't going to last that long. Anyway, let's get back to what the doctor said to me. So... So I had dilated cardiomyopathy. If you guys know anything about the heart, you know that's a really serious thing. And I said to him, am I, how long am I going to live, do you reckon, mate? And he was like, I don't know, Tom. I said, five years? 
And I wanted him to say, don't be so silly, Tom. You're five years, are you crazy? You're 32. And he went, I think that's ambitious. I was like, what the, what? What do you mean? He was like, you'd be lucky to make 12 to 18 months at the minute, mate. I was like, are you mad? No, he said, are you joking me? He went, I would never, I'd lie to you. That honestly, he goes, I'm sorry. He goes, I didn't never want you to ask me this. And I was thinking, of course I was going to ask you this. This is who I am. I ask fucking questions. What, how, when, you know? Fuck me, man, that was a real blow. I sat there and I thought, wow, you've just told me that I'm lucky to make my fucking next birthday. And I just felt numb. I sat in that chair fucking numb. As tough as I was, as tough as I thought I was, yeah, there was, I couldn't fight my way out of this. I couldn't, like, fight him. I couldn't, you know, any, everything in my life before that, people, problems, police, jail, I could always fight. I could get out of it. I could, you know, I could swing. I could fight. I could t talk. I could lie i could but there was just nothing i could do and i was just like okay i took it like that i never cried never had that feeling of being upset and i come out of the room my mum's crying her heart out you know she's been told by the nurses my mum's like cuddling me i just want my mum to get off me to be honest you know i'm thinking to stop making such a big deal you know and then she's like are you all right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm all right, you know? Then we go to the car, and it's a silent drive home. My mum still, I can hear my mum sniveling, and, um, you know, me and my wife had broken up at the time. I had to ring her and tell her, you know, she's really upset. You know, everyone's upset, you know? And, you know, I have like five brothers and sisters. They was all really devastated. So anyway, I go back to the hospital. They want to put a machine in me. And this machine was to shock my heart if it stopped, yeah? And I said no at first. I didn't want that in me. I'm 32, you know, no fucking way. And they were like, look, you know, this will save your life. They tried, like, talking to me. And you know what I mean? I wasn't as smart as I am now. I was a little bit more, um, you know, it was a difficult, and anyway, in the end, I said yes. They said it was a 40-minute operation. They're going to put it into my lap, which is a muscle there, and it screws right into my lap. Nobody can see it. Don't get me wrong, you could feel it if I put your hand there and you pushed hard enough. So anyway, I go into surgery. Yeah, it's supposed to be 40 minutes, right? And I come round, and I know something bad has happened because... I've got a really sore chest, and that's where they were pumping me. So my heart went into a, 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 a um, cardiac arrest. I had a cardiac arrest, you know, and they're doing everything they can to save me. And while shocking my heart, they didn't know at the time, which they couldn't have known, because I was so big and muscly, they, when they shocked me, they sent loads of creatinine and protein down to my kidneys, which shut my kidneys down completely. So when I woke up, I didn't just have heart failure now, I had kidney failure. My organs were slowly, slowly, slowly um, shutting down. And this was their fuck up, you know? And when the cardiologist just come in the room, he was like, Tom, I'm so sorry. I went, get the fuck out. You tried to fucking kill me. You fucking cunt. Now I'm upset. I'm upset. This is big, you know. I've got kidney failure. I've got fucking dialysis machine strapped to me. They had to cut me here because I had um, rhabdomyosis, which is, you know, what caused all the protein to come down, which caused carpet syndrome, which they had to cut my the trap here to let the... the because um, it was swelling up so much. They had to let the pressure out. So I'm there like that, and I'm waking up. And I've got all these problems. I'm strapped to these. I'm strapped to a life support machine. My family all come in, all crying. You know, my heart is getting more failing, and you know, I'm thinking, right, I'm ready to die here now. You know, this is me. I'm fucking gone. Yeah. 
and they get me and they blue light me to Oxford Hospital, which is a specialist hospital. And when I was in Oxford Hospital, I said, met the guy who was in charge. I grabbed him and I went, please fucking let my kidneys come back. I'm not being on a dialysis machine, yeah? It's not happening. And he said, look, we want to put a line in you. And I said, no, yeah? He said, do you want to see if your kidneys will bounce back on their own? I said, yeah, 100%. He goes, we need to do surgery on you again. I said, you no, no fucking way, mate. So they wanted to do surgery on the, the wound they did now. You know why? Because the doctor didn't close it properly. So when they took the bandage off, it fucking went pissed everywhere. So between the nurse that was there, when you're, on, in, when you're in intensive care, you have a nurse that's with you 24 seven. I got really close to her. She was lovely, beautiful woman. She fucking done any, anything I wanted. But that day she had to hold that wound so hard it was fucking hurting and she had to do it for six hours. So she held it for a while, my wife held it for a while, and my mum held it for a while. And I was like, guys, can you get the fuck off it now? It's fucking hurting. And they were like, we can't. Because if they let it go, all the blood was pissing out everywhere. This was like absolutely fucking shocking. So when the surgeon come, you know, after waiting six hours of this fucking absolute fucking torment of them squeezing so fucking hard on a muscle that's got carpet syndrome, which was agony. So they're fucking pushing it down, right? I don't want to go back into surgery because I think if I go back into surgery with my heart as weak as it is, I'm on dialysis, I'm not going to fucking make it. And he's like, you know, he goes, I promise we'll do everything we can. I said, be honest, am I going to make this? Am I going to get out of this, yeah? He said he can't be 100% sure, but he'll do everything he can. He said, look, I promise you, I will do everything I can to make sure you come out of this. So I thought, I'm walking into my own death. This is a bit like when I was in prison, you know, walking into the cell knowing that you're about to fucking fight someone. But this time I'm thinking, I might die and I've got nothing to swing back. It was the first time my life is out of my control. It's not out of my control because when I was in court, it was kind of similar. But this time, I couldn't I couldn't do anything about it. So they, I go back into surgery. Luckily, they sew it up. So I come back out. And you know what I learned? I learned that day who my real friends were. And they weren't the people I thought they were. You know, there's one guy. His name's Seb. I know he ain't going to mind me saying his name. Yeah. He's a person that owns this gym, Legends. Right? And... Me and him were quite close at that time. Nothing special, yeah? And he ring, he rung me. And I answered the phone. He's like, you're right, mate. He's like, he doesn't know I'm in hospital. I didn't tell anyone. And he's like, what's all that noise behind you? I went, I'm in hospital, mate. He went, where are you? And I told him where I was. And you know what? He dropped everything and come and see me straight away. You know, and when he come, you know what I mean? He was just like, oh my God, he was upset. He seen me like that, you know, I was strapped to machines, you know, I was in a fucking really bad way. And, you know, he came and, you know, just that support, man. He brought me loads of mad shit. He brought me fucking porno mags, fucking grapes, fucking you name it, he brought me it. It was a bag like that of just shit I really didn't need, but you know what, I loved him for that, yeah? and. You know, he's away now doing a long jail sentence, you know, but that there I'll never forget. There's a big picture of me and him when I was in intensive care in his gym. And I love going there, seeing it and seeing where I've come and how far I've come back. So I'm there like that. I'm in intensive care unit. I slowly make myself out. And then my kidneys, my it got this thing called creatinine. I don't want to make it too complicated for you guys. But creatinine is something that's it's a level of protein in your blood. Mine was the highest score ever recorded in England. It was 167,000. It was insane, right? And because I'm so big, that's why it was so high. And, you know, they come to me and they wanted me to sign this medical thing so my, my procedure can go in a medical journal in case that ever happens again. You know, so of course I, I was like, yeah, because I would want to save someone else. 
So anyway, I'm in intensive care. I go into a normal hospital. It was like being in jail, going from like the block into into um, a normal wing. And then, you know, slowly my kidneys were coming back. I could piss because when you've got kidney failure, you can't go to the toilet at all. They have to take it from you. They take it from you into this machine, and they strap you up to it three times a week. And I was just hoping, and that doctor, when I grabbed him that day, and was like, please bring my kidneys back. I can deal with my heart. I've done a lot of research on my heart. I haven't got enough energy to deal with my kidneys as well. That's what I thought, right? So anyway, so I start getting better. My kidneys get better. My heart starts getting slowly better. And they said I could go home for a couple of days, but I had to come back. It was like home leave from a fucking prison. It was really, it was so fucking, like, it was so similar, but in a different way. And I'm at home and I'm like, right, I need to understand what I'm fighting. So I research it like fuck. There's nothing you can tell me about dilated cardiomyopathy that I don't know. There is absolutely nothing. I know everything. I, I'm not saying I know everything. That sounds a bit um, sounds a bit narcissistic, but I know a lot. You know, I know as much as the cardiologists do about that about that um, about that disease. So what it is is your left ventricle is your pumping chamber in your heart. When you get dilated, it means it's dilated, it means it's um, thin, yeah? So I knew that your heart had to get thicker. And I listen, when you read up dilated cardiomyopathy, if you put it into Google, it will say you're lucky to live five years. It's a grim, grim disease. But I reached out to a lot of people, and some of these people are still alive. And I thought, right, I need to get fit, yeah? Because the fitter I get, surely the better my heart will get. And I need to, um, you know, get not be so heavy. And I slowly start doing this. I start going swimming every week, start doing cardio, you know, and, every, and then we go back and we check my heart. And my heart is getting better. They can't believe it. And plus, my cardiologist, I was so angry with what happened. I paid to go private. And when I went private, I, it cost a lot of money, but I seen the best cardiologist in this country. And he said to me, your cardiologist must really like you. I said, why is that? Because the tablet that I was taking was new and it was so expensive that he had to sit in front of a board of people and get funding for it. Because the, the guy that I paid to go private to said that he doesn't even do it here. It was a new tablet that was, you know, kind of, um, it wasn't kind of a, a test because it had done all, been through all the tests, but it was, I was, I was the first one in England ever to be on it, right? And slowly my heart got better. And, you know, I'd go for echoes. Yeah, my heart was still enlarged, but my chamber went from being 29, which is really bad, guys. You know, 29, they were thinking about giving me a heart transplant. And then slowly it got to 35. And then from 35, it got to 40. And every time I was going up, it was just getting better and better. And then the last time I went up there, guys, yeah, your normal heart should be between 55 and 65. Mine was 42. They were absolutely shocked. And, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm some fucking miracle. I'm not going to say what I did worked. I didn't know. You know, I took a lot of fucking um, vitamins and I took it. You know, if anyone's struggling with cardiomyopathy, contact me and I will help you. If you're new to cardiomyopathy, please, please just reach out to me because I needed someone like me when I had it and I will, or I will get back to you straight away. You know, and you know, I've come out of jail now, I've finally got a family, I'm finally doing good and a strong man, and now I'm dying, you know? That's how I felt, you know, a bit sorry for myself for a bit. And then I slowly started working on myself and getting better and better. And now I'm at a place where I know that I've got this. And yes, my heart has got better, 
but at any time I could die from this. I can name people that died from this. John Paul Sigmundson, the great strongman. The guy out of Green Mile, you know, the big black guy, he died from it. George Michael died from it. The list goes on of people that died from this disease. And because I've got it, I always notice it. And they all die around 50. Now, you know, I'm you know, close to getting into the 40s and, you know, I'm thinking, you know, have I got 10 years? They are getting better at dealing with this, but it's a long way off. I'm a long way off, you know. Most of the men in my side and my family don't make it to 60. My granddad died at 42. My uncle, he's probably not gonna make it to 60. And, you know, and it's hard. And because big people die young. That's just unfortunately the way it is. The bigger you are, the harder your heart has to work. And don't kid yourself on anything you put in your body you know, like I've done all these drugs I think about, all the partying I think about. You know, I've been no fucking angel with my heart. I have fucking asked my heart for a lot. How I'm still here, I don't know. I really don't know, yeah? And I'm at a stage where the machine is going, yeah? Because the thing I've realized and I made my own decision on was that having that machine in me, I ride super bikes. I've crashed my super bike a couple of times. If I would have crashed it on that machine, I would have been dead. So the machine went and the tablets that they put me on, I only take the one that was really expensive and he had to get, um, he had to get funding for it. I only take that tablet. Now that's my decision because the other tablets make me feel like shit. And I wanted to be in charge of what I did. I'd done my own research. My cardiologist respects my decisions. I've met some great cardiologists and then I've met one cardiologist that told me that, you know what, if I didn't lift weights, yeah, and do steroids, that's what he said to me. He goes, you would have lived for longer than 40. I walked out and I went, is that a good way to speak to someone? I went, did you like your someone to speak like that to your son? And I learned to deal with fucking authority without firing punches at them like I would a screw. I learned that if you said the word fuck, you've lost your argument. And I become good at it. And if I don't like a doctor now, I will happily say, look, I don't like you. I've got a serious condition. Can you go and get someone else? Because two things you don't trust people with in life. One's money and two's your health. They're the things you've got to look after yourself. Trust me, the minute you walk out of the NHS, yeah, they, they've forgotten about you. They will only start treating you when you become an emergency. You know, they will do your bloods and say, everything's fine, even though your liver value's gone up, even though your kidneys have gone up, even though your cholesterol's through the roof. They won't tell you this, you've got to do this. You've got to take care of your own health, take that in your hands because I promise you nobody else will look after it except you. Learn about bloods, learn about, say when you have a blood test, say can I have the machine please? I wanna look at it. And you look at it and you find out about it. Because I tell you what, they don't give a shit. You know, and I'm not saying this in a bad way because they haven't got time to modicoddle you because there's so many people that stretch the NHS. The NHS has stretched like fuck. Put it this way, before I had any part, any problems with my heart, yeah, I'd only been to hospital and to do with surgeries on a strong man, yeah. After that, I've been to hospital 70 times, yeah. You know, because every now and again, my body will get water on it from my heart, yeah. So I'd have to go back to hospital, put me on a drip, and um, they'll get the water off. But you know, that's something I live with. You, you know, guys, if you haven't watched it, I do boxing, you know, I lift weights heavily, yeah? And I know that lifting weights the way I do and boxing the way I do is shortening my life. But also, I can't just sit on the couch or in my room watching fucking films. I don't want that life. If it means I die early from doing what I'm doing, 
Then I die earlier. I'm happier. I made that decision. But guys, if you've got this problem, don't listen to what I'm saying. Because I've done a lot of research, spent a lot of time with doctors, and I come to this conclusion myself. You know, I I had their input too. I'm not one of them guys that think I know more than doctors, because I don't. But I'm just telling you that, you know, don't think for one second that, you know, the NHS care for you, because they don't. They just haven't got time. And that's not saying I've not met some amazing people, because I have. I've met some amazing doctors, and I've met some shit ones. That's just life. It's, it's, you know, and the NHS remind me of prison because of it's an institution, same as prisons, you know, and the food is the same pretty much. Um, the regiment the regime is so similar, you know. Um, the screws and the, the the nurses are so similar. Some are really nice. Some are fucking assholes. But anyway, guys, the reason I told you this, yeah, and I wasn't going to make this video, but I thought I'm going to make it because I've come out of jail, I've done all that time, and I come out of jail with something in me that was killing me, and I didn't know. If I would have stayed in jail, I would have died because there's no way jail would have picked that up, and I wouldn't be here now. So, yeah, it's bad that I got it, but, you know, guys, you don't ever see me moan about it. And this video is going to shock a lot of people because a lot of people don't know that what I've been through. I've been through hell. Hell. And I've never told anyone. And I've even done strongman competitions after all this has happened. You know, and I've done, you know, fucking charity runs, mud runs, 11 mile ones. You know, I've done loads of stuff, yeah. And for charity, you know, for the Heart Foundation. And sometimes it catches up with me and I might have to spend a week in bed you know and that's just the price I pay but I look at life like you know I I know what's going on with me you guys might have something that you don't know like always get your bloods done you can go private and get bloods done for 40 quid then you find out something and always look at your your um inflammation marker that is a big thing on your blood your inflammation marker that will tell you if you've got inflammation in your body nobody wants inflammation in their body because you don't know where it comes from and then once you find out the blood test on inflammation you get a sensitive information a sensitive inflammation uh, bloods done and that will tell you exactly if it's fouls in your heart so there's ways to find out guys and honestly don't think you're indestructible because you're not it can creep up at you at any time. And when it does, you know, men, it will it will test you. It tested me. But you know what? I'm an old school geezer, old school sort of man. You know, I, I, I was born in Northern Ireland. You know, I, I come up, brought up with fucking bombs going off and, you know, the troubles in Northern Ireland. And you know what? I know this is a long video, guys. This was a long thing. But you know what, guys? I fucking made it, and I'm here. And I'm not just a survivor of jail. I'm a survivor of fucking heart failure. And I'm here now speaking to you. And, you know, and I just want to pass on my information, and I want to pass on that. You know, get yourselves looked at, guys. Because if I was in prison, I would never have found that. Now, I said that a couple of times, it's fucking time for me to go. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something from it, you know. And I hope that you learned something about me from it too. You know, that, you know, I'm a fighter, I'm strong, I'm intelligent, but I'm also kind. And, you know, any, like I said, anybody, just contact me, honestly. Right, guys, I thank you. I know this has been a long video. Um... But it's an important one, so if you get the opportunity to watch it, I really appreciate it. It's me giving a lot of myself away, but, you know, I don't care anymore. Do you know what I mean? Um, I want to help as many people as I can. So anyway, I want you to have a nice night. Thank you for watching this. Appreciate you guys. Have a nice night. Take care. And remember, right, the best thing is to be free, and the best thing is to be healthy. So remember that, and have a good night.